Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 103, March 6th to March 12th, 1863. Last week, we talked about Northern conscription and Democratic copperheads. This will be something to keep in mind as we move forward in our story that there are those who are opposing the war effort in the northern states. We'll get into it in a future episode, but there's also a conspiracy theory where some of the Midwestern states would effectively branch off from the Union, and that it's not really a realistic possibility, but it's interesting to have that thrown out there, that some of these Midwestern areas are not quite so gung-ho in terms of abolition, so it's something to keep in mind as well. We also had action in Georgia on the coast and Tennessee at Thompson Station, the first major action since the Battle of Stones River. This week we're going to head out to Mississippi to check in on further action around Vicksburg. We also need to take time to talk about the Fairfax Courthouse Raid. Speaking of Fairfax Courthouse and the raid is conducted by Mosby's Rangers, and that's a good segue to talk about our new Patreon episode, which is going to be a review of the memoirs for John Singleton Mosby. So that should be posted here shortly to the Patreon feed, and again, the Patreon is in the show description, and you can get an extra episode, whether it's a memoir review, a tea, we do movie reviews as well, and some picture slideshows showing you the modern-day battlefields that I've thrown up there. So if any of that sounds like something that would interest you for as little as a dollar a month, you can actually have access to those episodes. So, uh, of course, those proceeds are going to go toward the general upkeep of the show, so it is very appreciated. Before we get into Fairfax Courthouse, let's talk about Confederate impressment. Already in our story, we have talked about the Confederate Conscription Acts, but this month we are going to move into the Impressment Law. And while it's not going to officially be passed until the 26th, We're going to talk about it a little early. So, in a nutshell, with the conscription and the draft, that would be pulling the available manpower resources, and that makes sense. But for impressment, we need to take stock of the material that could go toward the war effort. This would most notably go toward food to feed the army. Additionally, this would also include the impressment of enslaved individuals from citizens to go toward the Confederate war effort. Oftentimes, this was to build fortifications or other works. We have briefly mentioned, perhaps already in our story, that in terms of camp followers, a lot of these support functions like, say, cooks or driving wagons, what have you, this would be another area in which these individuals would fall under. The building of fortifications would be important, especially in the coastal states, where Confederate soldiers were a little more scarce. Remember, we talked about how Fort McAllister, amongst others, had enslaved individuals that had worked on their initial fortifications and then repairs after damages done by Union bombardment. Commissioners would be sent to negotiate prices with farmers, an arbiter deciding what was fair if no agreement was reached. As the war continued to progress, these prices would be less than market value. Additionally, there was a lack of logistical awareness at times, which would lead to goods going to waste. 
It was a well-used ploy for Southerners to impersonate impressment agents to acquire goods for their own purposes. As you can imagine, this policy as a whole was not popular amongst the Southern populace. Combine this with battlefield defeat, and there you have some not-so-happy citizenry. This may have led many to engage in irregular activity or otherwise be further turned off from the conflict. We should also mention that instead of just foodstuffs, this would go toward cotton as well. So it's actually mirroring some of the same things that these northern agents are coming down and doing in terms of the cotton trade. They're able to acquire the cash crop for less than market value. So when you have both sides doing that, engaging in these unfair practices, then you could imagine, right, that the farmers, the planters are going to be sort of disenfranchised from both. So it's an interesting parallel there. We will keep overall impressment in the back of our minds, where it's actually going to be coming up fairly quick in the summer here, where things are going to come to a head. So stay tuned for that. Now, we talked about guerrillas and irregular warfare in a previous episode. While we had a lively discussion on the bands not affiliated with the Confederate government, we did mention partisan rangers. The most famous of the partisan bands was commanded by John Singleton Mosby. Mosby, of course, attended Hampton, Sydney, and the University of Virginia prior to the war. He served in the 1st Virginia Cavalry and was taken under the wing of Jeb Stewart and William Grumble Jones. Leaving the regiment because of his dislike of Fitzhugh Lee, Mosby would take advantage of the opportunity provided by the Partisan Ranger Act of 1862. After the war, Mosby would comply with the Republican government and serve as a consul to Hong Kong. Mosby was actually elected to the first U.S. Army Ranger Hall of Fame, along with other famous rangers from different time periods. Now, Mosby wanted to do things that we talked about in our Irregular Warfare segment. His job would be to disrupt the Union supply lines. If there were more Union eyes fixed on him, then it would be less men to fight Robert E. Lee and his army of Northern Virginia. Quick hit-and-run tactics and raids to make the enemy uneasy would be the name of the game for the 43rd Virginia. Mosby especially prides himself in a tactic where his men will charge and then peel off from a body of the enemy. It's kind of a quick strike. They're going to, of course, use revolvers as their primary weapons. And that is very similar to what we already discussed with other guerrilla bands, especially in Missouri. A requirement for being a ranger was simple. You needed to have a horse. We mentioned that for guerrillas in general, a horse was a valuable commodity that made their type of warfare possible. Similar to the rest of the Confederacy, you needed to provide your own or you could always steal one from the Union Army. Much like the war in Missouri, revolvers were the primary weapon of the Rangers, who carried as many as six. While Mosby would have some 2,000 different men ride with him at one point or another, usually the numbers were relatively small. The largest number of Rangers on a particular raid was actually 350, Many of these were young men, 18 years of age. Some of them would come straight from the Virginia Military Institute, having been recently graduated cadets. A common problem when engaging these men was the nature of their network. Engaging one group of rangers would mean that others would show up in support. This would probably add in terms of the legendary and fearful attitude toward this unit. Mosby would not allow for election of officers. Instead, he would handpick them himself, 
adding to their combat effectiveness. There are several accounts in our memoirs already of the fear that Mosby and his partisan rangers sparked in the Union Army. In that regard, Mosby and his men were very successful in tying down resources. The region in which they operated in northern Virginia would become known as Mosby's Confederacy. Not everyone loved Mosby and his men. Thomas Rosser, who was not really an effective cavalry commander, had the following to say. Mosby's men are a nuisance and an evil to the service. Without discipline, order, or organization, they roam over the country, a band of thieves, stealing, pillaging, plundering, and doing every manner of mischief and crime. They are a terror to the citizens and an injury to the cause. First, it keeps a man out of the service whose bayonet or saber should be counted on the field of battle when the very life or death of our country is the issue. Second, they cause great dissatisfaction in the ranks from the fact that these irregular troops are allowed so much latitude, so many privileges. They sleep in houses and turn out in the cold only when it is announced by their chief that they are going to go upon a plundering expedition. Third, it encourages desertion. They see these men living at their ease and enjoying the comforts of home, allowed to possess all that they capture. Patriotism fails in a long and tedious war like this to sustain the ponderous burdens which bear heavily and cruelly upon the heart and soul of man. Now, Thomas Rosser, as I mentioned, is not really an effective cavalry commander during the war, so maybe he was a little bit uh, jealous of Mosby. And all these arguments are fair. These are the kinds of arguments we talked about in the episode we had about guerrillas, in that it is very true, you are taking these men out of the ranks of the regular army. But I would argue that in the case of Mosby and McNeil's Rangers, also in Virginia, these men are doing a lot more in terms of holding down resources of the Union Army. They're more disciplined too. They remain fixed regiments as opposed to just being so-and-so's band, right? Like Quantrill's band or Bloody Bill Anderson's band. Uh, these men are going to have more fluidity when it comes to the men in their ranks. And you could easily just decide you weren't going to participate in a raid or you were just going to sit things out entirely. Whereas, while there's no guarantee that that's not going to happen here, there is, like I said, more military discipline. Mosby, and we'll talk about it actually in the memoir review, so you might want to check in on that, uh, tries to keep things very disciplined. So there's not as much plundering as, say, Rosser might assert here in his statements. Now, on the flip side of that, though, if you are a unionist and you're living in Northern Virginia, then yeah, you're probably going to have some of your stuff stolen. And that's where these networks come into play. They're able to suss out the individuals who are going to give them up or who are okay to plunder from. And that's just a common thing that happens in war, right? So it's not necessarily unheard of. Likewise, Mosby's men were not well liked by the Federals, some of whom being executed after being labeled bushwhackers. A famous reprisal of rangers being executed actually saw potentially the son of Montgomery, Meggs, being killed. Meggs would be bitter as a result of his son's death, and especially the supposed nature of his death, being executed after wounding. Meigs would blame Robert E. Lee for the war and start to bury dead soldiers on his property at Arlington. Thus, we have the creation of Arlington National Cemetery, where you can still see Robert E. Lee's house today. Something else that we're actually going to cover in our memoir review for Mosby, but it's questionable as to whether Mosby ordered the execution of Meigs. He claims he didn't do it. There is a separate scenario in which uh, Union prisoners are executed as a reprisal for some of his rangers being executed. So that is mentioned, but it is not the same situation in which uh, Lieutenant Meigs is killed. 
January of 1863 would see the beginning of operations for the Rangers, but it would begin with only nine men. Success would lead to more men and the ability to create a full battalion. There would be many noteworthy raids carried out by the Rangers. One famous raid, called the Rose Hill Raid outside of Alexandria, was designed to take out the provisional government of Virginia. French Delaney, a ranger in Mosby's command, would lead his comrades to a house and actually capture his father, who is a colonel in the Union Army. The reason his father is important is that he is the aide to Francis Pierpont, who you remember is the provisional governor of West Virginia. French would gladly show his father he was well supplied with Union boots. Another famous raid actually captured a Union paymaster. A key capture of the money would lead to the Rangers being well supplied during the war and even after. These are just some of the exploits of the 43rd, and we may mention more as we go along. An exploit from this week is probably one of the more famous raids that Mosby carries out. March 8th to March 9th, 1863 will give us the Fairfax Courthouse Raid. Their target at Fairfax Courthouse would be supplies, as well as a little headhunting. This location has already played a part in our story, being a place where the Army of the Potomac gathered before the Seven Days Campaign, and very close to the Chantilly Battlefield. General Edwin Stoughton of Vermont had made Fairfax his headquarters in 1863. Stoughton was described as a bit of a fop, and certainly enjoyed the finer things, including music and entertaining at the fine house at Fairfax he made his quarters. Working with Stoughton was a federal cavalry officer named Sir Percy Wyndham. Wyndham was an English soldier of fortune, serving in a variety of conflicts, including the American Civil War. He had commanded the 1st New Jersey Cavalry at Thoroughfare Gap, and will eventually be wounded at Brandy Station. Wyndham was a particular target for Mosby and his rangers, as the Englishman was not a big fan of the Confederate irregular tactics. The regiments in Wyndham's brigade were well known to the rangers, these including the 1st West Virginia and 5th New York. But there was a concern about the activity of the rebels. Stoughton would write, your dispatch, containing dispatch from the Army of the Potomac, is received. The enemy has made no demonstrations anywhere in my lines. I will inform the Major General Commanding that I have discovered that our cavalry pickets do not keep up a connected line on our right. Thus, the right picket of Colonel Wyndham's right rests on the Ox Road. Then there is an opening of a mile or two before reaching the left picket of the command at Drainsville. This should be remedied, as it gives free ingress and egress to any wishing to give intelligence to the enemy. If anything transpires, I will inform you. Last night, about 9 o'clock, while I was at headquarters at the station, a man, undoubtedly a spy, was at the courthouse, dressed as a captain. He interrogated all my servants minutely, respecting the troops in the vicinity, asking if I kept my horse saddled in the night, and other suspicious questions. There was proper cause to be concerned about potential infiltration. Mosby may have been inspired for a plan to capture, among others, the two officers who were up against him in the area by a new recruit to his command named Frank Ames. Ames, known as Big Yankee, was unique in that he was a Union deserter from the 5th New York Cavalry. Big Yankee had been less than enamored by the Emancipation Proclamation and thus sought to join the Southerners. Along with Ames, 29 men gathered at Aldi, in the cold and snow, which was still on the ground. Only Mosby and Ames would know their true destination. It would be important for the former Union man to accompany them, as he had good knowledge on the troop dispositions. The small band moved down the Little River Turnpike, and found a place to make it through the Union picket. In fact, there was a soft spot close to the Ox Hill battlefield. It's also another name for Chantilly, in case I had not mentioned before. Leaving the main road, the band made their way through the picket, aided by the snow on the ground, which muffled the sound of their horses. At 2 a.m., men under Mosby entered Fairfax Courthouse. 
this move by the rebels was if we can quote the princess bride inconceivable all the pickets encountered were taken by surprise as they were under the impression so far behind the union line they would be safe once gathered in the square the men would disperse to acquire the various union mounts and search for officers to capture percy windham fortunately for him would not be present as he was away in the district of columbia Ames would actually capture his former captain at the house Wyndham made his quarters in. A small world incident. While disappointed that their arguably main target was not present, Mosby found out that Gerald Stoughton was. Leaving men in the yard having captured couriers, telegraph operators, and horses, Mosby would enter the house with pistols drawn. Showing their knowledge of the enemy regiments, they would claim to be from the 5th New York with urgent dispatches. Stoughton was fast asleep and rudely awakened by the rebels. Demanding to know the reason for the intrusion, the Confederate commander asked, Do you know of Mosby? In the dark, Stoughton responded by asking if he had caught him. To his surprise, the man who awakened him revealed that he was in fact Mosby and that he was, in fact, capturing him. Mosby would not betray that he only had 29 men, and deceived the general into thinking Fairfax had fallen. The federal general was interested in seeing Fitzhugh Lee, whom he had attended West Point with. Once gathered outside, there was a great confusion with men and horses. Ames proudly presented Mosby with the personal effects of Wyndham, a consolation not having caught the man himself. In the darkness, the Union captors would not know that they were in fact the superior force. Some did take advantage of the black of night to escape before they could be ferried away by the fast-moving column. Stoughton did not have that opportunity, a ranger being tasked to holding his reins. Mosby would not let the biggest prize slip away. Actually, he came close to also capturing the commander of the 5th New York, a Lieutenant Colonel Johnstone who had attempted to stop the column, but was alerted to the rangers laughing at his attempts to order them. Johnston was able to escape through the house he was staying and would mount a pursuit. Mosby would move and double back, throwing off the New Yorkers, who would go in the wrong direction for some time. Eventually, the party would ford Cub Run and then Bull Run. A Mrs. Dogan, whose house had been destroyed during the fighting at 2nd Manassas, would provide the rangers food. Mosby was then able to deliver his prisoner to Fitzhugh Lee at his headquarters at Brandy Station near Culpeper. I like to think that Stoughton was able to have a conversation with Fitzhugh as he had intended when first being taken prisoner, but I was not able to confirm that. The prisoners were then transported to Libby Prison, arriving on March 11th. While the enlisted men were quickly paroled, the officers were kept in confinement before being exchanged in May of 1863. A general, two captains, 28 enlisted men, and 58 horses were captured as a result of the Fairfax Courthouse raid. Several citizens of Fairfax and the surrounding area were arrested as a result, but they could not catch Mosby. I do want to also very briefly mention John Hanson McNeil. Now, when the Partisan Ranger Act was repealed, there were only two Ranger units who this act did not apply to. Part of the reason for the doing away with the Partisan Ranger Act was that there was generally a lack of discipline in the regular units, as we have talked about. Additionally, as we may have mentioned in our Gorillas episode, there was a need for manpower to go into the regular army, so the hope was that if there was no longer any monetary support from the Confederate government, then these troops would go into the army and have a little influx in manpower. While most were told to muster into the Confederate army, there were exceptions. The first, of course, was the extremely affected 43rd Virginia, commanded by Mosby. The second was the 62nd Virginia, commanded by McNeil. McNeil was a native of West Virginia, who had ties to Missouri, living in Boone County. Now, Boone County was a hotbed of secessionist activity. It factors into the Battle of Carthage, which we talked about way back in 1861. 
McNeil will serve in many of the early Missouri battles, being captured following Lexington. He would return to Virginia and create a partisan ranger unit operating in the western part of Virginia. Mostly, he would stay in the Shenandoah Valley. The 62nd would have their fair share of famous raids, including on the B&O Railroad. While McNeil would be killed in 1864, men under his command would capture Generals Kelly and Crook in 1865, an event we talked about when discussing John O. Castler and his memoirs. McNeil is a lot like Mosby. He's going to keep unit cohesion and discipline with his men as well. So that's why he is spared this repealment of the Partisan Ranger Act. Let's go ahead and stop our episode right there. We talked a little more in depth about John Singleton Mosby, who really begins his writing career in 1863. The Fairfax Courthouse Raid is up there in terms of the most famous raids, bagging a Union general and perpetuating the myth of the Grey Ghost. We also talked about the Confederate Impressment Law. Next week, we'll talk a little about the battle at Fort Anderson, start Longstreet's Tidewater campaign, and mop up a couple of introductions we may have missed. If you like what you hear, please leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website, as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Your support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Once again, feedback is welcome. Questions, comments, concerns. The email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week. <laughs>